Okay, I'm Alan Barnett. I'm with the Utah State Archives. And uh, today, how'd that get to that? There we go. Okay, and the title of my talk is uh, Discovering Past Lives. So um, anybody who came here hoping to, you know, channel into their past life as a gypsy princess or as a, I don't know, as an elf in Middle Earth, that's going to be another presentation. That's not today. We're actually, we're talking about getting to other people's past lives. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the family history resources at the Utah State Archives. Okay, the, I, I just want to point out the Utah State Archives shares a research center with the Utah Division of State History. Uh, the Utah State Historical Society to provide access to both collections in one location. Um, but today, um, and state history, they have this broad mandate to collect all kinds of documentation of Utah history. And you can see what they have by going to their website at heritage.utah.gov. The, the state archives has the responsibility to document the history of state and local government in the state of Utah. And so um, we have a more narrow scope of collection. And that's what I'm going to be talking about today. I'm, um, but I just wanted you to know that there are other, there are other resources um, in our research center from the State Historical Society um, that, that may be of interest as well. We're just not going to cover those today. So, okay. I want to talk about uh, archival sources and, and genealogical research. Point out archival sources are the foundation of genealogical research. Re research. Uh, your genealogical information is only as good as the sources that you, that you draw it from. And um, sometimes it's easy to forget that, I think, in doing genealogy because a lot of our genealogy and genealogical information may be passed down um, from parents, grandparents, great-grandparents, that sort of thing. Um, but in the end, uh, we can only get so far. We may be, I may be able to talk to my mother or to my a grandfather or something and find out information of things that they remember themselves. But you get back very far, and there's nobody who remembers that information. And the only way that we have of knowing that is from the records. The documentary sources. So, um, so archival sources are key to good genealogical research. I would I would urge when you're doing your genealogy to keep track of those sources. Um, and if you've done family history very much, you've seen all the, the, the you know the genealogical information that may be passed down to you. You may get from other people. And very seldom do you see that people have sourced where they get the information from. And you look at it and you say, well, that's, you know, that's a great story. Or, you know, that looks like a nice date you've got there. But where did it come from? How reliable is this information? Um, so keeping track of it and then passing it on as you pass on that information, whether you're writing a history or you're doing family group sheets or pedigree charts or whatever, pass on that documentation of, I didn't just make up this number. I didn't just hear it someplace. I found it in this specific document, this specific record. So, okay. When you're working with, when you're looking for genealogical information in archival sources in at the state archives, you have to think not just what information do I want to know. You have to think how might my family have interacted with government. What kind of records would government have created that would contain information about my ancestor? And that's the key to knowing where to look. Okay, the Utah State Archives website is probably the best place to start searching for, your, for what is available here at the archives. And, and the most useful tools are name indexes, some of our records have been indexed by name and you can just punch in an ancestor's name and you may find that we have some stuff right off the bat. 
It won't give you everything we have, but but it you'll get the you may get the, your fastest results that way. Okay, we have research guides um, that will help you understand what kind of records we have, and then we have a catalog search where you can just search the different records. Uh, this is the research center website that web page, so this is a good place to start, and it. it, it um, it, yeah. you can see you could go either to the state history collection or you can look at the archives collection there from this research center page. And this this uh, this site is history research at utah.gov. Okay, the name it indexes most. This is our name index search page where you can just enter in a name. Most government records do not have a name index. The vast majority have not been indexed because there's, it's a huge volume of records. Um, but, but we have indexed some that we think are particularly useful. And that includes some birth and death records and a variety of other things. So this is where you, you might start your search just to get the, the easiest stuff first. Okay, then we have research guides. They provide overview and background of commonly used records so that you understand what kind of records are available, what kind of information they may contain. Um, so you can see here our, um, our research guide includes guides for vital records, guides for court records, a whole variety of different kinds of records. And so you can look and that will explain what the records, what kind of records we have, and then um, specifically uh, the records that we have for different time periods, for different areas of the state, that sort of thing. Um, okay, and then the and then we have a catalog, and the catalog is sort of like a catalog. Like if you went to the public library, you might search the catalog. You don't want to search by name because if your ancestor is mentioned in a book in the public library, if you search their name, that book is not going to come up unless the book is about them or they wrote the book. That's not going to come up. It's the same thing here. So searching by a name here is not going to be helpful. That's where you have to think of, well, what interaction might my ancestor have had with, the, with government in Utah? Or what, um, what records might the government have kept about my ancestor? And then search by the government entity or the type of record rather than searching by the name. OK. That's just a general background about doing research, about how, how you approach research into records at the state archives. Um, and so um, now I want to just give you some examples. And a lot of these are going to be from my research that I've done on my, fa my own family and what I found in the different records that we have here. And uh, this is actually a picture of my great-great-grandparents and their family. And, and whoops, that wasn't what I wanted to do. This right here. This right here is my great grandmother, who I actually knew when I was a kid. Okay. One of the things that can be found in government records that's really fundamental and useful in, uh, in family history research are vital records. These are the records that tell you births, deaths, marriages those basic events in a person's life that help, I, um, that help create a framework for the story of that person and identify that person. Okay? So in Utah, no governmental ag agencies were required to record births prior to 1898, which means it's very difficult to find any kind of official birth record in, for someone born in Utah before 1898. Salt Lake City and Ogden began reg registering births as early as 1890 in Park City in 1892. So there are a few, in a few places you may be able to find something earlier than that. So, um, but if you're looking for a birth prior to those times, you're probably gonna have to look to other sources, not to go government sources. Okay, from 1898 to, eight, to 1905, uh, County clerks became responsible for recording births in the state, throughout the state. 
And then in 1905, the State Department of Health took over responsibility for creating birth certificates. And that's when you start to get um, more reliable, more complete coverage of births in the state. Okay. Birth records become public after 100 years, and that's when, they that's when we get them. That's when they become available at the state archives, is after 100 years. So, um, in theory, um, you could get a birth record for anyone who was born before October 3rd, 1916. That would be available here at the archives. For anything less than 100 years, you have to go to the Bureau of Vital Records. Here's just an example of a birth certificate. This is actually my grandfather's birth certificate, um, born in Union in Salt Lake County. Um, and you can see the kind of information that, and you see how useful this is if you're doing family research because it gives, it gives his name, um, although sometimes in these records, especially early on, all they, will, it, they won't have a name. It'll just say a male child. Um, but eventually, you'll see um, usually a, a name. Give a date, birth date, which is March 12th, 1910. And this one gives parents' names, where they live, how old they are, where they were born, what their occupation is. So it gives a lot of, there's a lot of information there um, to start building that, um, building your, your um, pedigree chart. Okay, deaths um, follow basically the same pattern as birth certificate. Before 1898, the only cities that were recording deaths were Ogden and Salt Lake City. In 1898, the county clerks become responsible for recording deaths. And then in 1905, the Department of Health takes on the, that responsibility and starts creating death certificates. And these become public after 50 years. So. Um, anything that's, uh, that's more recent than October 3rd, uh, 1966, is available here at the State Archives. And for anything before that time, you, you need to go to the Bureau of Vital Records. Okay, here's an example. This is my great-great-grandmother, uh, Eliza Barnett. And here it gives the days that she died, the cause of death, which is always sort of interesting. Um, occupation, where she was born, she was born in Scotland, and her parents' names, which of course, you know, is very useful in linking back another generation. Um, it's always interesting to me, to me it, that it gives the person who provided the information, and this is Clara Barnett Bean, which is their daughter, so it's a great, great aunt of mine. Um, and then it'll tell where they're buried. So if you're trying to find the location of someone's grave, um, this is always useful information. Okay, cemetery records are also a useful source of information. And especially before the time period when they were creating official death records, this became, this, these often become an alternative source for death information, alternative death record. And the archives, I have to note, only holds records for cemeteries that are public cemeteries. They have to be government-owned cemeteries for the archives to have the record. And they can offer a, a variety of information. Here's an example. This is the death record of my great-great-great-grandfather, Philo Johnson. And you see, um, he died April 5th. Okay. He died April 5th, 1896. So this is before the county is even recording deaths. So where he died in Utah County, there's nobody keeping an official record of deaths except for the cemetery. But this has all kinds of information for you. It has his name. It has his parents' names. It has his birth date, where he was born, when he died, and the cause of death. Uh, and then the location of where he's buried. So, which is that, you know, that's about as much as you could want from a death record. 
So these old cemetery records can, can be really useful in that way. Um, cemetery records can also contain other information. Some, and there's a variety of different cemetery records. Some are just about where people are buried, and some of them are about plot ownership. Um, I had uh, a situation where um, I was looking at my great, great, great grandparent and where they were buried in the Salt Lake City Cemetery. And so I looked into the records because there were no markers. And um, I think they were, I think the markers were washed out in a flood at some point. And so there were no markers on the whole plot there. So I looked into the cemetery records and found that, the, that I found where they were buried, but I also found that the whole plot was owned by my great great grandfather, by their son in law. And that made me, I thought, well, and then I could see who else was buried in the plot. And they, they were people with names that I didn't recognize. But I knew that they were, the whole plot was owned by my great great grandfather. So I knew they had to be, there had to be some kind of connection. So it prompted me to start then looking into these people. And I find out, well, the, one of them is the second wife. And one of them is the son of the second wife. And one of them is a married daughter who has a different surname and her child. And so I start by looking at the cemetery records, I'm able to find these people who are connected to the family that I wouldn't have otherwise known. About. This is another cemetery record. And this, um, this is an example of, uh, of, I think, sort of how sometimes records can like bring the story closer to home. Um, so in 1901, my great grandmother died um, from complications in childbirth. And my, my grandmother was, I think, seven years old at the time. And, um, and I know this story. I know that this happened, and, and it seems like a sad thing. But then I ran across this record here, and uh, here it says, W. Harper, William Harper, who was her husband, for cemetery lot, $6.20. So here, in March, March 9th of 1901, suddenly... I see my great grandfather going to buy a cemetery lot that he had not planned on buying. And then it says, W. Harper for digging grave, $3.25. So he's going and he's taking care of these kind of burial arrangements. And somehow, even though I know this happened, seeing it there for me is sort of poignant because I can envision him having to deal with this unexpected death of his wife and all those, just the routine sort of arrangements that had to be made. So um, it doesn't give me tons of information, and yet it sort of brings to life for me the reality of what that must have been like to have a young wife die. Okay, another really important source of information that we have here at the State Archives are court records. Um, okay, court records are can be come in a variety of different forms. There are different kinds of cases that are heard by courts. Civil cases are one kind. Civil cases are proceedings, court proceedings that involve two different parties at odds. So. Um, this is when one party sues another party saying, I've been wronged, um, and the court decides. So this is, always, um, this is always one person versus another person, or one entity versus another entity. That is a civil case. Divorce records are among the most commonly used uh, civil case records, because that, they're always, those are always one person versus another. Right, so there's civil cases. Um, an example here, uh, this is my great-great-grandfather, James W. McHenry, and um, we always knew that Grandma and Grandpa McHenry uh, were divorced, and we sort of knew this general time period, but nobody had ever bothered to look up the divorce. So I decided, well, I'm gonna see 
what I can find out here. So I went and looked in our index and found the case uh, and found that it was grandma who sued for divorce. And then it gives me some information because grandma goes to the court and says, I'm suing for divorce and this is why. I'm suing for divorce because my husband disappeared on this date and was gone for several weeks and came back and would never say where he had been and then disappeared again and um, just hasn't been around. Um, so, and then, and then he never, in some cases, the person will file for divorce and say, this is why I want a divorce. And then the other person will respond and say, well, that's not what, what they say about me is not true or whatever. He doesn't even respond. He doesn't contest the divorce and the divorce just goes through. So I now have a little bit of a story of, I know when it happened, and I have a little bit of a story about what was, what was going on, although obviously there's still a lot of questions there about what may have happened. So that starts to, that starts to uh, fill in some of the story. And that's one of the great things about the archives records, I think, is we may get we may get birth and death dates, and that start to sets up a framework for um, understanding the life of one of our ancestors. But then I can also get into these other things that start to fill in and tell some of the stories about their life, about what they experienced, who they were. It's not just names and dates. Um, they start to become real, more real people. And I, and I start to understand a little bit more about uh, Grandpa McHenry when I understand that he just disappeared. <laughs> and, um, and, well, and then, just, uh, so I started talking to my grandma about this because then later on in this same case, she comes back and, and to the court and says, grandma comes back to the court and says, he's not paying alimony. And he responds and says, well, I am paying alimony. I've been, I've been paying off her bills. I've been paying her bills. And here's all the receipts for all the bills that I've been paying for. And so I asked my grandmother, who was their granddaughter, and who knew them. And, she's like, and she says, oh, grandma wasn't very good at, with money. She never could keep track of money. And so she'd go, so she'd go to the... Um, She'd go to the drugstore or the grocery store or whatever, and she would put things on account, and then she wouldn't keep track of it. And so Grandpa would go in and just pay off her account. And, and so that's how he was like, you know, that's how he was paying alimony. And so she said, she said I remember, you know, like the telephone company contacting us and saying, Grandma hasn't paid her telephone bill. And, Grandpa would have to go in and pay the telephone. So I, there again, it's an opportunity to learn more, you know, sort of get a better idea of how the, who these people were. Okay, another example, another story with this one. So I'm looking for the divorce case, and I find another case with his name on it. And I'm like, well, what is this about? He's suing somebody, so what is this about? Well, so I pull that case out, and there he's suing somebody. Um, Grandpa McHenry had a livery stable in Murray, and um, people would come there. So if you were if you were coming, to, you know, from someplace out south into the valley, you might come into Murray, leave your horse there, and then take the streetcar up to Salt Lake, whatever. And so he had this livery stable where he would house, you know, take care, care of people's livestock. And um, so he files this complaint and says, this man came in to leave his horse, and he had a package, and he asked me if I would hold on to the package for him uh, while he was gone. So I took the package, and um, he didn't tell me that there was a loaded gun in the package. And I dropped the package, and the gun went off, 
and shot me in the leg. And I had to have my leg amputated. And <laughs> I was like, wow, I've never heard this before. So I went to my grandmother and I said, did you know about this? And she's like, oh yeah, Gran Grandpa always had a wooden leg and he always walked with a little bit of a limp. <laughs> and I was like, wow. So here's this, here's another story that fills in, you know, and, in, and it's in his own words. He tells, this is what happened, you know. And so he sues and I can't remember, he gets like 150 bucks or something. You know, for his for his trouble getting shot in the leg. So, and he he ended up doing okay. He was a, he was a very successful businessman and became uh, mayor of Murray City and whatnot. And he did really well. But um, he was he's he's one of more colorful figures in my family history because he was in, he had his fingers in a lot of different things and was sort of adventure. So, so yeah, so. So other cases will just shed light on these events in people's lives, things that they're involved in that you never would know about if it weren't for some court case like this. So, Okay? We also have criminal cases. A criminal case involves charges where someone violated the law. And so it's going to be um, the state of Utah, typically the state of Utah versus a person. Um, um, and the criminal case files, they include a variety of documents. They'll have the charges, what they say, you know, that this person, how they violated the law, and occasionally there's, very occasionally, they'll have a transcript of actually what was said in the case, which is always fascinating, but usually those are thrown away. Um, um, and in some cases, there'll, even, there'll be exhibits, that, you know, like photographs or that kind of thing to go along with the case. But, um, and then we also have other criminal records. So if someone's convicted and goes to the prison, we will have a record of the time they were in prison. And one of the great things about these prison jail records is that they usually include a mugshot. And sometimes, especially if, you know, if your ancestor was a horse thief, they didn't spend a lot of time in the photo studio, so you may not have many photos of them, but you may be able to find one in there. We had, this is a couple, few years ago, we had a woman come in and um, she said that she, her father went to prison before she was born. And, um, and after he got out of prison, left and then died when he was young and she had never seen a photo of her father. And we were able to dig into the, to the prison records and we found a mugshot and provided her with a photograph of her father. So, Okay, then there are probate cases. And probate cases um, have, to, have to deal with, um, primarily with estates, but they have to deal with, the pro with property and with, um, the status of individuals. So um, estates for deceased persons, guardianship for minors, name changes, adoptions. And so they're always, they aren't so-and-so versus so-and-so, they're always in the, in the matter of. So in the matter of the guardianship of so-and-so. Okay, adoption records are really valuable in family history, but they are sealed for 100 years. After 100 years, they will they become public, and anybody can see them. Prior to that time, you have to have a court order to see an adoption. So, but if it's been more than 100 years, you may be able to find an adoption and make that make that that link that, uh, in your um, in your pedigree chart. Um, some of you learn a lot from probate cases, and sometimes this is just an example. This is not one of my relatives. But this is John Beasley in Provo, someone I did a little bit of research on. And you'll see, it'll, it will, he died in 1864, I believe, and it goes through and lists everything he owns from you know, harness to pots and pans to like the property his house was on or his farm. Um, 
lists everything. And it's really interesting to see, you go, wow, these people really, I mean, it's a long list, but that's still, if I tried to list everything that I own now, it would go on just pages and pages and pages if I list every little thing. So, but it helps you understand sort of what people's economic circumstances were, gives you an idea. If you see things on there, you're like, well, why would they have that? And you start to think, well, I guess the only reason they would have that is because they are doing this sort of activity. And so it gives you an idea of the sort of things that they are using and they're doing in their everyday life. So. Okay. Court records also include naturalization records. Um, so if you have ancestors who came over from another country and, and became citizens of the United States, um, then there may be a record that will, that will um, document that. You can use the censuses. Some of the censuses, they ask them when they naturalize, because that's a lot of the trick is figuring out when it happened. But a lot of times in some of the censuses, they will they ask the question, when were you naturalized? And that gives you at least a starting point. Usually they, natural, they naturalize in the, the closest court. They can, early on, they can naturalize in any court that they want. But usually it's going to be one that they're living closest to. And eventually it's, they're required to do that. Um, since we don't have an index, you have to try to figure out time period and location to try to narrow down your search. Uh, they standardized the process in 1906, and in 1906, then they, they start to ask a lot more information, for a lot more information about when they came over, what ship they came on, where they were born, that sort of thing. Whereas early on, it's mostly just, I'm so-and-so, um, and I want to become a citizen, and I'm going to relinquish my allegiance to the king of Norway, whatever it is. Okay, since the 1930s, most of these records are kept um, by the federal government, um, but we have a lot of stuff prior to that time in there, um, and they're really a goldmine. They're just, it takes a little bit of sleuthing to, to find them, so. Okay, we do have some military records at the, at the state archives. Um, Official military service and discharge records are federal records. But, and so a lot of times you'll have to go to the federal government to find those. But we do have some of those here because the state at certain times has made an effort to get copies of, of those records for people who served in the military from Utah. Um, but in addition, they've, the state has also created some collections um, related to the, the territorial militia and the National Guard, and also to just to collect information on, uh, on people who served, on veterans in Utah. Uh, one of our best collections is from World War I when this, uh, the State Historical Society sent out questionnaires after the war to all of the veterans and asked them questions about, um, about when they were enlisted, where they served, if they were injured, that kind of stuff. Um, and then they also said, could you also send a photograph? And so, so we have all these questionnaires where people wrote out in, in their own hand uh, about their service and then a lot of them, both of these photographs here are from our collection of photographs. And they're just, they're just fantastic. Some of them are like formal portraits. Some of them are in their uniforms. Some are not. Some are casual photographs. It's just a whole mix, but it's just fantastic. We're in the process of putting those online right now. So, um, but you won't necessarily find everybody. I looked for my grandfather who served in World War I and he, for whatever reason, he didn't send in a questionnaire or, or a photograph. So, um, so you won't find everybody there, but there are a lot. Okay? Just some uh, examples of other records that may be of interest 
in doing family history. The brand registers are, um, are sort of interesting. Anybody who had livestock um, or a fair number of animals um, usually would brand them to identify them. So if the animals got away or if they were stolen or whatever, they could be identified. And so usually if somebody just has a horse to draw, take, draw their wagon or whatever, they're not going to bother. But if they have a herd or something, then they are going to have a brand. And then they would register the brand with the territory or with the state um, so that if somebody found their animal, they could look up that brand and it could be identified as to who owned it. Um, and this is just an example. Thomas Hepworth is the man who built my house. And so that's why I've done a little research on him. And, um, and you can see um, it gives his is uh, a lazy T, which means it's laying sideways, and an H on the left hip or thigh right there. This is when he registered it in September 11th, 1866. Um, who it's registered to and where he's living which is also interesting to me because that also tells me where he's living at the time, which I would not know otherwise. He's living in E.T. City. So, so those are always interesting. Okay. Okay, we have a wide variety of other records, um, including educational records. So we have records of uh, of we have student records for sort of a smattering of different schools around the state, but including like uh, Salt Lake High School going back to 1890 when this high school was first started. We have incorporation records. So if, you're, if you have an ancestor who was involved in business and uh, formed a corporation, then we may well have... Um, records for that. And I found, I found one of my ancestors who was involved in one of the co-ops. And so he's listed as one of the officers in the co-op um, in the town where he lived. So that's another window I now know that he was, in, that, that was one of the things that was, he was involved in the community. We have O's of office for people who held office, particularly at the state level. Um, we have some land records. Um, and this is an example at the right of a land record where someone who was um, was making a claim to land in uh, in San Pete County, um, they were filing an affidavit with the probate court um, that they own this land and trying to get title to it. And then we have justice of the peace records. So um, these are the justice of the peace handled like local was a local um, court and. Uh, one of the things that Justice of Peace records, the old Justice of Peace records include, are marriages, which aren't necessarily recorded anywhere else. And so, um, and there again, you have to you have to figure out well, where where did my ancestor live? Is there are there any Justice of Peace records for that time period when they were living there and um, that area? So, okay. We have a lot of stuff online. Of course, not ev some people expect us to have everything online, but that's impossible because we have so much stuff. But we have over a million items, items online, and we have partners, partnerships with Family Search and Ancestry to, to put things online. So a lot, a lot of our stuff is available on Family Search and on Ancestry, as well as on our own site. Um, the most popular stuff is the birth and death certificates, and they're regularly updated to try to keep them as current as possible. Um, but it makes it easy when you can just sit at home and look at this stuff on, on your computer. Um, for everything else that's not online, uh, you need to come into our research center, which is located at 300 South Rio Grande. And we're open from Monday to Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. And um, you, you can email us at historyresearch at utah.gov or go to our website, www.historyresearch.utah.gov. Okay, any questions or comments?
Um, 